perhaps you've seen or heard of Arabian horses, you know them by the distinct uh, shape of their heads. I'm told that Arabian horses go through a rigorous training in the deserts in the Middle East. The trainers require absolute and complete obedience from the horses, and they test them along the way to make sure that that happens. Now, after a long training period, a testing period, the final test is almost beyond endurance of any living thing. The trainers force the horses to go without water for uh, a long time, for several days. Then uh, he turns the horse loose. Now, as would be expected, the horse would run towards water, but just as they get to the edge of the water, ready to plunge in and drink, the trainer rings his bell or blows his training whistle, and because the horses have been so completely trained and have learned perfect obedience, they stop at the sound of that whistle. They then turn around and they pace back to the trainer where they're standing there quivering, wanting water, but nonetheless they stand there and wait in perfect obedience. Now when the trainer is sure that their obedience is fully there, he gives them the signal to go back and then they go drink water. What an example of unconditional obedience where one is so disciplined that they are able to override their natural impulses to do what is asked. That's a hard thing to do. And that might seem, uh, on the, the first uh, glance with these horses, seem severe. But when you're in the desert of um, Arabia and your life is entrusted to a horse, you want to know that that horse is trained in obedience. And if we are to compare it to what God wants for his people, it would be immediate and total obedience. We're back in the book of Haggai. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Um, there's a pew Bible in front of you if you don't have one. Um, you could turn there as well. Remember, you find the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, and flip back three books, and you'll find the book of Haggai. We're in chapter 1. And we see here um, the people struggle. Um, we see a struggle with them to be fully obedient to the Lord and to do what he says for them to do. Now, if you remember, the people had been in captivity for 70 years because of their disobedience. But when Cyrus became king of Media and Persia, he developed a policy of allowing enslaved peoples to go back to their lands to rebuild their temples and to resume their religious practices. And so he, the Jews start to return on to their homeland, which took place under several stages. In 536 B.C., they came in under Zerubbabel. Then in 457 B.C., a second group was led by Ezra. Then in 445 B.C., a third group returns, led by Nehemiah. But it was during the first group that this man Haggai came, and it was then that the work began on the temple, as we've spoken about. The altar of sacrifice was restored, and the foundation of the temple was built. However, after a while, as we remember, the people ceased their work. They stopped working on it. The city and the houses, the walls were all in ruin. And, and if you remember, as we talked about, food was scarce. So what did the people do? They turned their attention towards their, their living and to just surviving. But after a while, they did more than just survive, and then they started to turn their attention to the luxuries of life. And in the process of that, they became apathetic towards the things of God. And so God raises up Haggai, who comes along with a prophecy to get them to regain their spiritual priorities. And so he rebukes them for their procrastination. Look at verse 2, Haggai chapter 1 and verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Now, whenever you see the words there, thus says the Lord, you know it's coming directly from God. Did you see how God refers to them? He calls them, he says, this people. He's, he's, he's disappointed at them. He's upset at them because of what they were saying to him. They were saying, the time has not come. God, the environment is not right for this now. And so God asks them in verse 4, he says, 
Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Basically, he's saying, if it's not time for me and my house, is it time for you to live in your paneled houses? Now, as we said before last time, that God doesn't have anything against paneled houses. But God is pointing out that their priorities seem to be off. And so he reminds them that some of the things that they were facing in their lives were because of their disobedience. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. The agricultural problems that they were facing were his doing. The seeds that they put in the ground didn't sprout as much. And even the ones that sprouted didn't bear as much fruit. Even the rain was held back. He even hit their clothing. Look at verse 6 again. And he says, but no one is warm enough. No matter how much clothing they put on, they could not get warm or they didn't have the clothing they needed in order to be warm. And then notice also he hit their wages in verse 6 again. And he who earns, earns wages to be put into a purse with holes. Inflation was so much that when they put money into their pockets, it was as if it had holes in it. Why did God do that? Look at verse 9. He says, You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own home. God says, I blew it away because of my house, which lies desolate. These people had been in the habit of not worshiping for so long that instead of running to God's house, they were running to the comforts of their own houses. And so as a result, there was no house of God for them to run to. So God, by his own hand, was holding back the rain. He was saying that if you don't take care of much of my house as your own house, I will blow away all your prosperity. I'll blow away all your luxury, all your pleasure, all because of the reason he told them they left his house desolate. But it doesn't have to be that way because there's something that they could do. There's a remedy for this. And so if you're taking notes, there's a note taken outline in your bulletin. I want you to know this first, the remedy for their poverty the remedy for their poverty. And and he had warned them in in verse 5. Look at it, Haggai 1, verse 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then, again, in verse 7, he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Again, God is saying here, think about what you're doing. Set your heart on what you're doing. Think about what you're saying. Think about what your actions are portraying. Think about how you've acted and think about the results that have come from how you've acted. You said that it's not time to rebuild a temple, but look around at the things that I'm causing to happen, God is saying. Think about what you're doing and think about what I'm doing. And as a result, um, he said, consider your ways. Now, we should also think about it. For example, in America and in other parts of the world, people have been saying the same thing for for years. They've been saying, it's not time. They've been saying, God, stay out of our lives. We'll, We'll leave you out and we'll pursue what we want to pursue. And so we shouldn't be surprised that God does the same thing to us and starts to take away some things for us to get our attention. And so God says to them, you want this to stop? then letter A, put God's priorities first. Put my priorities first. Because he says in verse 8, go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. And so he gives them a direct command to go get wood to rebuild the temple. And God wants to impress upon them the importance that they take it seriously. 
He didn't just want uh, them to, to throw up a building as quick as they could, but he wanted something that he could be pleased with. He wanted something that would glorify him. He wanted them to give their best effort. Do you see some parallels there? And, and so then it's natural for us, for us to ask the same question. What does God want from us? What does God want for our lives? He wants lives that he can be pleased with. He wants lives that will glorify him. He doesn't want the non-effort that we sometimes give to him. And so he would also ask us to consider our ways. Matthew 6.33 tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, the people in Haggai's day, they had it reversed, right? They went out and they were seeking all these things. They didn't seek first the kingdom of God. And God's saying, reverse it. This is the priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's a simple remedy. If we just obey God, we would not drift from the things of God. So the first thing is that they need to put God's priorities first. Notice letter B. He says to them, don't continue drifting. Now, you know what I mean by drifting, right? It's the slow slide from the things of God. And this is not something that happens overnight. Uh, it, it's a gradual thing. Now, keep in mind, there have always been drifters, um, you know, like we see in Haggai. But it, it seems that there's no time like the present where we have seen so many drifters. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about people who are living in out-and-out -out disobedience uh, and rebellion. We certainly have people who are doing that. Instead, I'm talking about a drifting that's slow and gradual. It's kind of like when you go to the beach, right? And you put your stuff down on the sand and, and you go for a swim. And after some time swimming, you look up and in front of you and you realize that where you put your stuff in is not where you were. It's up the beach a little bit. So what do you do? You adjust yourself, you go in the water and you adjust yourself so you could line yourself back up with your stuff so you could see it. And that's, that's happened to, to all of us if you've been to the beach. And, and that's what drifting is. You don't realize it until it happens. You're, you're in the water, you're moving along, and then it happens and you have to readjust. Now the word drifting is, is a word that means to let pass by, to carelessly slip. It was even used outside the Bible uh, of a man on a raft drifting away slowly with the currents. He's not connected to the shoreline or he's not connected to another boat. He's just floating out there. It was a word that was used of a woman who was wearing a ring that just slips off of her finger and she loses it. It wasn't something she planned to do. Um, it just slipped off her finger. And none of us, uh, when we drift, go into it thinking that we will drift. It just happens over time. Nobody comes to the Christian faith thinking that I'm going to serve Christ for a few years and then I'll just drift back into my old life. No one starts attending GBC with the intention of stopping coming in a couple years. It's a slow thing. And the people in Haggai had not planned to let 16 years drift by without prioritizing God. The years just ticked by, and they ended up far away from God. And that's a warning that we'll see constantly in the Bible. God constantly warns about drifting. For example, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 2.1, he says, For this reason, we must pay, pay much, much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. Notice that word, closer. It's basically saying we have to keep a closer watch on what we have. You see that word in there? What we have heard, have, right? It's not, it's in the past tense. This is saying that we already have the knowledge, and so it's not a lack of the knowledge. It's a lack of paying attention to the knowledge. It's not a problem of hearing here. It's a problem of heeding, and so God cares about how we pay attention to what we know. Now, I know I, I usually fly a couple places a couple times a year. I know some of you a couple times a month. But when I do, the first thing that I do when I, when I sit down, when I get on the plane, 
after I wipe down the surfaces, and this is before COVID, by the way, I was wiping down the surfaces, um, is to read the safety cards. I pull out the safety cards and I flip through it and I read through it. And I make sure to pay attention when the flight attendants are giving the announcements and showing the safety instructions. But do you ever look around on the plane? What's everybody else doing? They're on their phones. They're reading books. They're napping. They're talking to other people. They could care less. But there's a problem with that attitude. Look at Hebrews 2, 2 to 3 on the screen. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You see, God wants us to pay attention to things. You see, in Hebrews, he's speaking to Christians who are drifting. In this verse here, he's not appealing to the lost person. That's not what he's doing here. He's not telling the lost person to become a Christian, but rather he's encouraging the Christian to pay attention to what they have received. See that word neglect in verse 3? It's a word that means to be careless or to make light of. And so he makes a comparison in these verses here with how God dealt with violations under the old covenant to how he might deal with violations now under the new covenant. Listen to, to, to the comparison. Let's read the verse again. Pay close attention. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. Now, stay there. Go back. He's saying every violation back then that was delivered by angels was not changeable. And there's a whole slew of verses that talks about it. God uses his angels to deliver his word. The law to Moses was delivered. Angels had a part in that. We see that all throughout scripture. So that's what that's talking about, all right? God uses angels to deliver it. And and. It was unalterable. There was no changing it. It came from God. It was not changeable. And when people messed up in the Old Covenant, they were punished by God. Now look at verse 3. He says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This means that the penalties today are going to be even more severe. You see, a lot of times we look in the Old Testament, we say, God in the Old Testament is so severe and he acts so rashly. No, this is saying, this is even more severe because the prophecies had not come through angels now, but through God's Son. Look at verse two, 3 again. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after it was first spoken through the Lord? It was confirmed to us by those who heard. So God is the same God in the Old Testament. He feels the same way about sin that he does now. Um, he may not do the same things that he did in Israel, but he still hates sin and he will punish sin. The word of God came through the Son of God and in the same way there will be consequences. Now, what are some of those consequences that he will use today? Well, we don't know. Possibly natural consequences. Um, you know, there's natural things that happen when we don't follow the word of God. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. There's the law of sowing and reaping, right? Sooner or later, we will reap what we sow. If we as parents drift, before we know it, our kids will grow up and their hearts have grown cold. Why? Because many times over the years when we should be in church, maybe we blow it off and they see that. And then they drift over time. Now, that's not the exclusive case all the time, but, but that does happen. And so we, 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 can, we can go to sleep on, on certain things and, and people will notice and we drift. And so it starts really slow. And then there are consequences for every action that we take. So God warned the Jews, not only in Haggai's day, but God warned them many times before about disobeying him. Jeremiah 11, 3 to 4. Thus says the Lord of the God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant, which I commanded your forefathers 
in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do according to all which I command you. This was a common theme. But the people in Haggai's day, like their forefathers before them, like us today, don't hear heed that warning. And they and the Haggai, people in Haggai's day, they had a long drift. But then after 16 years of drifting, after putting their own priorities first, their hearts were finally ready and they listened to the prophet. And so we see number two in your notes, the renewal of their purpose. Now look at how they responded. Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the word of, words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Now notice letter A, what we learn, the people's immediate response. Right? The renewal of their purpose, the people's immediate response. Did you notice that word then at the beginning of verse 12? That shows a cause and effect. As soon as they heard the word, then they responded to it. There was a renewal of purpose, and the people responded to God's word. They didn't just listen to it or hide it in their heads, but they hid it in their hearts. And they acted on it. This reminds me of our verse of the year from several years ago, from Ezra 7.10. It says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. So we see there he studied it, he practiced it, and then he taught it. That's what these people did. Notice that everyone obeyed. Look at verse 12 again. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnants of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence for the Lord. It started with the leaders, and it went down to the people. They heard what God said, and then they listened right away without complaining about it. Notice at the end of the verse 12, it says that the people showed reverence for the Lord. It, it means that they showed fear, and it's fear that resulted in their action, which led to letter B, God's immediate reaffirmation. They did what he said, he reaffirms. Look at verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying... I am with you, declares the Lord. This is a neat verse. And if you remember, I said, this is what I want on my mausoleum, right? Um, I, the Lord was with him, you know, says the Lord, right? And so God saw how they responded, and he commissioned Haggai to tell them something. Verse 13, I am with you, declares the Lord. He was with them. They obeyed the voice of the Lord even though it was not easy for them. But with their obedience, the Lord was with them. Remember, they had just come out of 70 years of captivity and had spent the last 16 years in spiritual lukewarmness. But they heard God's voice, they responded to it, and he was with them. It's kind of like what God said to the church at Laodicea, Revelation 3.15. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Now, these people in Haggai's day were cold for 16 years. And then when God spoke to them, they didn't respond lukewarm. They didn't just start to sort of warm up and, and, and then, you know, limp into it. They responded hot. And you know what? This teaches us a good example about what happens when we obey what God impresses on our hearts. He tells us that he is with us. It's not that he will be with us at some point in the future, but once we start to obey, he is with us, present. Sure, we may have disappointed him with 
disobedience in the past, but when we realize that and we repent and we start to obey, he is with us. Did you know that he will be with us or he is with us when we share the gospel? Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come up on you and you shall be my witnesses even to the remotest part of the earth. All he asks is that we are his witnesses. And when we're willing to do that, the verse tells us that he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. He is with us when we are afraid. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? He's also with us when we feel distant from him and that he doesn't love us. Romans 8.38, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord is, your, is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will quiet. He, he will be quiet in his love. He's also with us when we need comfort. Psalm 23 and verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 48, 14. For such is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us until death. God is also with us when we are weak. Psalm 46, 1 tells us that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is with us when we need peace. John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He's with us when we are tempted to think that certain things are impossible. He tells us in Luke 1, 37, For nothing will be impossible with God. And he is with us when we confess and repent. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us uh, from all unrighteousness. You want me to keep going? I mean, he's with us. And guess what? These people realized their sin. They confessed it. And God said he is with them. Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Look at the people's response, letter C. The people, they arise and build. Now, after years of indifference, disobedience, misplaced priorities. The people realize where they went wrong. They repented, and then they now move to knowing that God would be with them. Look at verse 14, Haggai 1, 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. The Lord stirred them up. They weren't just stirred up for a minute with an emotional experience. But this is something that changed their lives and made them able to persevere in the work of the Lord until the temple was built. They went back to the heart of worship and they discovered that it was all about God. They said, Lord, we're sorry for the thing that we made it, but we realize that it's all about you. This was a good thing. But do you know what I worry about? That as we embark on a new model 
starting October 3rd with our, our service time at 9.30 and our community groups right after and the midweek community groups and, and all that. People are excited and they're like, yes, let me sign up. I'm going to do it. And, and, and we start our outreach efforts. But then by December, everything stops. Christmas comes and we get a little busy. Then the new year comes and we start drifting a little. But we need staying power. You know, sometimes we see people seemingly stirred up but it's not permanent. It's just an emotional experience. But when God stirs people up, <clears throat> it's a real stirring. And they move to action. And we ought to pray for that. We need to pray that God would stir up, stir us up by his Holy Spirit. And it won't be like what happened in Florida where they claimed it to be a true revival. And they proved that it was... A, so-called proved there was a true revival by barking like dogs and doing those sorts of things. Other sensational things. But listen, a true revival from God, guess what happens with it? Obedience and humility. It's not going to be the sensational stuff that we see. Obedience and humility. And it will be like these people, how they responded. Verse 14, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts their God. God stirred them up and they came and worked. Do you know what prevents us from working like we should? When we think that we're alone. We think that we're the only ones doing it. We don't know that God will be with us. We, we didn't know that sometimes and sometimes we, we get confused with that. We think we have to do that by ourselves. But we have a promise here in Scripture that God will be with us. And so for these people, it took them about a month to start the work of God's house. Look at verse 15 again. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Now, if you remember, in the message in verse 1 had come on August 29th, 520 B.C. We had talked about that a couple weeks ago. And verse 15 here that we just read tells us that the rebuilding started the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Now, that's beautiful because you could go back and date it. So the date then was September 21st, 520 B.C. So the first message, August 29th to September 21st, just a little bit less than a month and which is the same time of year as we're in right now, right? Um, you know, and, and they, that means that they had time in those three and a half weeks to go and gather them all the materials and all the resources that they needed um, and to get the job done. They were procrastinated, procrastinating before, but they acted upon what God told them through Haggai the prophet. They obeyed and responded, and in a very short time, even though they had been asleep for 16 years, they considered their ways, and they obeyed God and started building. Are there areas of your life that you have been inactive in for periods of time? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and, and into your heart about it? Why don't you respond right away? Just say, Holy Spirit, I hear you, and I'm responding. You have your way in me. The people here could have said, Lord, it's been 16 years. It will be difficult to start now. How do we start this up? Can't we just leave it alone? Or they could have said, how will we make up for all those years? That's the other thing sometimes people will say. God, I've been inactive for so long, and I, I just I, I can't do it. Like it, I've, I've you know, been so bad, I, I can't make up for it. I need to make amends. How will I make up for it? We might as well continue as we have, some people might say. Maybe you're saying the same thing. Maybe you've been ineffective for God in certain areas of your life, or you've been inactive in, in some way. And you can't possibly see how God might use you in the future. You're like, God, how could you? You, you don't see what I did, God. Yes, he saw it, but, but how, how can he? I, I, did, I did all this. How can I make up for lost time? 
but he can. This is one of my favorite verses, Joel 2.25. There's a context to this, but let's look at the application. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. See, the people that Joel were writing to, it was a similar thing to the people in Haggai's day where they were ignoring God, and so God sent along uh, the locusts to destroy their agriculture, to get their attention. And guess what they did? Like the people in Haggai's day, they responded. And then God says, I am with you. And he says, I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust. And so the application that we can pull from that is, once we are obedient, he can make up for all the lost time. Now, obviously, we suffer consequences to our actions in the past and so forth, but he's talking about the future and how he's going to use us. He makes up for that lost time. You see the three types of locusts there, the creeping, the stripping, and the gnawing. The creeping locusts, when they came in, they ate the leaves off of their plants, right? And you think, all right, do we, still have, we still have the stems. Guess what? The stripping locusts, they eat the stems, and you think that's all that's left, then there's a little root and a little nub, the gnawing locust comes and then they eat that. And so there's different stages there. It doesn't matter what stage you're in. Once we're obedient, God makes us productive once again. Isn't that amazing? You see, today the temple of God, like with these people, um, it, it's, it's, it's his people. It's not a building. We should be... We should be doing things not for a physical building yes we should keep it up but kingdom building because i don't believe that god wants us to be just another church in shrewsbury now i've been telling you about um, all the people who watch our live stream from all over the world and um, especially what god is doing down in the philippines and and I do that not to brag and say, oh, we have a worldwide ministry, that kind of thing, but for us to take notice of what God is doing. To not just think it's just happening, but to say, God, what are you doing? You see, we tend to think locally. We just think about Shrewsbury and the surrounding community, but God thinks globally. Put those pictures up there, Lily, for me. Um, these are some pictures from uh, Grace Baptist in the Philippines, and it'll be up in a second here. This is a picture. This is Grace Baptist in, in the Philippines. We've been talking about them, and they, they watch our live stream. This is a picture of their building. This is Grace Baptist Church in the Philippines. Go to the next one. Um, this is the inside of their building um, where they're worshiping. Um, they have a lot of young people there. Next picture. Um, this is a picture. This is Pastor Luciana there um, from Grace Baptist in, in the Philippines. He's doing uh, uh, outreach ministry, and this is him um, preaching, giving the Bible time. Next picture. You can see that there. Next picture. You can see some of the kids. They do a lot of outreach to kids. Next picture. Next one. And then this was from their outreach last December where they um, were giving Christmas gifts of food to the kids um, who would come. And so I'm going to challenge us to get involved this December uh, to, to be a part of that. And so for, for $250 that we will do, it can reach, feed 10 kids. So we'll talk more about that. Is there another picture? All right, so that's Pastor Luciana and his wife um, as well. Now play this video real quick. I want you to see this. So I just wanted you to see that um, we've been communicating and listen, the interesting thing is, and you could put the other verses back up, Lily, but a lot of the outreaches in the bush, this video was there. But, but God has linked us up through the magic of the internet, right? And I just observe and I watch what God is doing. And I ask him, what role should we play in this? Put up the Habakkuk verse, um, please, Lily. Habakkuk 1.5. 
Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. God is a global God, not just a Shrewsbury God. We just have a small part to play in this little thing. And he says in Habakkuk, he says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe it if you were told. It's not just about what we're doing here. We need to get our spiritual houses in order so that we could be part of what God's doing throughout the world. He wants us to be building his kingdom here on earth, which takes time and commitment. You've probably heard the story of the time management expert who was speaking to a group of business students, and he pulled out a large wide mouth jar and filled it with fist-sized rocks. And when he couldn't put any more, he asked, is this jar full? And the class responded, yes. And he said, really? Then he pulled out a bucket of gravel and he poured it in, shaking it down through the cracks. And then he asked the question again, is the jar full? And the students were onto him at this point. They said, no. Good, he replied. He then dumped in a bucket of sand. Once more, he asked, is the jar full? And they shouted, no. Again, he said, good. And he poured in a pitcher of water until the jar was full to the brim. And then he asked them, what's the point of this illustration? One student shared, no matter how full your schedule, if you try hard, you can always fit more in. He said, no, that's not the point. He says, the point is, if we don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them all in. And this is so true, but according to this passage, if we are to apply this to our lives, what do you think our big rocks would be? It's the things of God. It's the things that God wants us to prioritize, which are the spiritual things, our spiritual growth, service, his work. And then when the big things are in place, the most important things, then God gives us room for the other things. What's the status of your jar? What are you cramming in besides the big things? Let's reorder it and do it the way that God wants us to do it. Let's pray. We come to a time of response where you've heard God's word. What is he saying to you and how are you going to respond? Maybe he's been speaking to you throughout the whole sermon. And maybe you've already responded and said, God, I am yours. Take me. Use me. Maybe it's to respond for salvation. And to say, Lord Jesus, I want you to save me. I've been trying to do this on my own. I've been trying to do this through works. And I realize it's not by works that I'm saved. It's only through Jesus Christ. I need to make you first in my life. You need to be the priority. Call out to him and say, Lord, save me. Maybe it's some other priority that God's been impressing on your hearts. You respond this morning as I pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word and for speaking so clearly in your word to us. Help us in the quiet of this moment to respond to you and not to put it off any longer. Immediate obedience is what you require. Thank you, Lord. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.